All right, let's transition into something a little bit more uh, serious. And uh, a couple of years ago at our um, Christian Men of Business luncheon, I heard a guy speak that uh, really impressed me. And so uh, we've actually become kind of friends. We don't see each other talk as often as we probably would like to. But uh, the times that we've been together, I've been really impressed. So Todd uh, has quite a, quite a history. When he was uh, 21, uh, he realized what he wanted to be. And at 28 years of, of age, he started training horses for the public. By the time he was 32, he was in the top 50 money earners in the world of reigning. He's given clinics all over the U.S., Europe, Canada, Mexico, and uh, has published in some of those places. Uh, he's won multiple North American championships, uh, several fraternity and uh, derby championships. He coaches. He's got an arena out here in Bergheim. He's, he coaches amateurs, and uh, some have finished in the top ten in some of these championships. Three of his youth students have competed in D1 uh, as, as D1 athletes in college on equestrian teams. And uh, he thought for many years that what he was doing was glorifying God. But as he will share with us tonight, he realized that there was more to life than just succeeding in that arena. Excuse the pun. So, uh, Todd, come share with us. Can you hear me? Good. Um, so Phil gave me a nice little introduction that I, uh, I train horses for a living and, um, <clears throat> I'm really kind of fortunate to have gotten to do it. And, and I think one of the funnest things about doing it is being able to, um, to actually get to share with other people and educate other people about what it is that, that it is to train a horse. Um, the raining, does anybody know what raining is? Has anybody ever seen raining? Two kids. Nice. A couple of other people. So, yes. So we've got a couple of you. The rest of you got no idea, right? Nothing much more than it's a trail ride. So there's a little bit of difference between just breaking a colt out and just getting one started and actually going to the level of, of training one for some of the competitions that I get to do. Um, uh, as Phil said, I took my first riding lesson when I was 21. Um, and my whole purpose in going and taking a riding lesson was that I've been asked this before. Is like, so what inspired you to to, to go and and you know ride a reining horse? And it was actually because all my roommates at college had girlfriends, and they were all on the rodeo team. And I didn't have a girlfriend. And I figured, well, at least I could go and learn how to ride a horse, and maybe I'd pick up a girlfriend. Um, so I went and took my first riding lesson, and uh, and I actually saw and learned what a, a, just a lead change was, which is like lead change. Got no idea what that is, right? And um, I got to ride this little mare named Rose. And Rose did something that I had no idea a horse could do. And Rose could just, if you asked her to do something, you looked where you were going, it was incredible. She would just do it. I mean, like, how many people have gotten on a horse and you're just trying to keep them from not doing something, right? This one, you just look and try to do, and she just did it. It was incredible. And at that point, I crawled off the horse, and what she did was she spun. She could spin so fast that I actually got sick and threw up. <laughs> but I did it when nobody was watching. But she was so incredible with what she did. I realized at that point, that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't even want to pick up a rope. So actually, for the next 20 years, I never picked a rope up. And that's all I wanted to do was learn how to train a horse. I wanted to teach one to do that. If I could teach one to do that, I... I could, I could pick up a rope and do whatever I wanted to do, but I wanted to do that. And so I completely delved into this whole thing of training horses. Um, so to give you a little bit of an idea of what I do, um, I teach them to do not just a regular old stop, but when I say, whoa, I can be running as fast as a horse can go. And when I say, whoa, and actually I say, I, I train them three different ways. For them to understand, whoa, or stop, right, is that I either say the word, whoa, I can pick my hand up, or actually when I'm riding, I can take my legs off, right? And so I'm going to show you a little video, and if you watch when I'm running and running really fast and I go to stop, my legs just go, boop, and they go off, and that horse breaks on its hind end and runs on its front end, and she'll slide about 30 feet whenever you go to a stop. 
The other thing that I teach them to be able to do is I actually can control all the parts of the body. So if I want to place and move the shoulder, I actually can teach them footfall. So if I want them to pick this foot up and put it right there, if I ask at the shoulder, I can ask, and they'll tell them exactly where to place their foot. So there'll be part of the video where you actually see them running, and when they're running, they're running along, and this is actually a lead. They lead with one leg or the other. And as they're running full bore, running around there, I've got a five-foot section where I apply this leg pressure instead of this one, and they change from which one they're leading with. So as they're running through, they're gonna change direction, they change the lead, they're doing it at the same time. If I'm five feet further, I get penalized for it. So it's really, really precise, really, really fast, and then the other part is I do it on loose rein. So I don't have to hold on to them, I don't crank onto them. My job is to make it look like this horse is willingly does everything that I ask it to do. And ideally, I'm supposed to make it look like I didn't do anything. So the communication level gets really, really high, and the level of difficulty becomes even higher, and this actually makes it a lot of fun. And part of the video, I even stuck my little kid in there too. You wanna to play the video? This will give you an idea. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, mostly, mostly that is to just give you an idea of the refinement in the, in the work. And in order to get to that point, I really have to, I have to actually, before I get anywhere with the horse, I have to actually start to establish a communications with one, right? So part of the communication of starting a, 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 a relationship, right, we have to have a common language. And so he's not going to know my language. I have to understand that horse's language. And in order to understand that horse's language, he actually views the world from a different place than I do, right? He sees the world in a different way. The way that he sees the world is the, he sees the world as a prey. He sees the world as he's food. I don't see the world that way. Everything that I do, the way that I act, the way that I do things, everything that I do is from a predator's point of view. Whenever I walk up to a friend and, hey, go to say hi, that doesn't look really good to something that's a prey. Everything is high and tall means I'm going to eat them, right? There's a couple of ways that I start to know. Kids will probably know some of this. How do I know that a horse is a, or an animal is a prey, prey or a predator? How? It doesn't eat meat. Doesn't eat meat. That's right. Well, I don't know. I've known some people that don't eat meat. They don't know that they're kind of scary. What else? The meat eaters have, uh, have sharp teeth. And, yeah. and the non-meat eaters have flat teeth. Yeah, so the meat eaters have big sharp teeth. What else? And sometimes the way they act. And the way they act a little bit. The other thing that I'm going to notice about a predator versus a prey, 
is that a predator has his eyes on the front of his face, right? And a prey animal has their eyes on the sides, right? Cows and deers and horse, they all have their eyes on the sides of their head versus cats, dogs have their eyes on the front. So they process things differently, right? They actually have their eyes on the sides of their because they can kind of get an idea of what's going on around them. And they actually process things differently. So anything that's taught from one side has to be completely taught from the other side too, right? So everything is interpreted through the lens of being a, a prey animal, right? Everything, so everything looks scary. And, and a lot of times when people look at horses and they'll go, you know, let him go over and check that out and see what it is so it doesn't seem so scary. Everything's scary to a horse. If you're walking around and you're scared of things, they're gonna go, well, if you're scared and you're, you shouldn't be, I'm gonna, let's get out of here, right? So me being confident, understanding that I've gotta be a leader and there's a way for me to lead makes a big difference for a horse, right? And, and that's one of the first things that I've gotta really understand is that they actually understand things completely differently, right? The other thing is, is that in order for me to tell them how to do something, I have to understand how they're gonna interpret what I do. And so one of the things that a horse does that um, you can, you've seen, there's, it's actually been shared a lot in, in, uh, in, in clinics and stuff nowadays with horses is they we start to understand how they communicate and how they, they converse with each other. And the way that a lot of it's done is um, they do it in a, with a more of a herd mentality. And if you think about the way a herd works, um, the babies, the young colts and fillies, they live with all the mares, right? So the mares actually do all the discipline, right? And there's a certain way that they go about doing it. Whenever a young colt or filly goes and starts acting up, they're a weanling or yearling and they're getting a little rowdy and they're getting silly about stuff. Those mares will actually, you know, they don't go and take them and set them in time out. It's a little bit more violent than that, actually. Those mares will actually kick the crud out of one right? And chase them out of the herd. And at first they're dancing around and they think it's all funny and whatever else until they realize I'm pretty vulnerable. And then they start coming back in and those mares will kick them out of there again. And it gets pretty rough. I don't care what you want, get out. And eventually what that colt will do out on the end of that, uh, away from the whole herd, because that's his protection. He wants to come back in. Eventually he's going to start to apologize. And the way the cold apologizes is he starts to drop his head and he licks his lips and he starts acting. He's walking around and he's going, I, you know, I just eat grass. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not scary. I'm sorry. And the way that those mares accept them. Now, the way that the mares accept them, if you can imagine this. Now, put this in a work environment. We're standing around the work environment. You're out of the herd. I'm over here with everybody else by the water cooler, right? I've just chased you out of there and I'm looking at you right? And you're asking to come back in. Can you be friends? And I turn and I just look away. That's how it's accepted. Only of us, somebody does that to us. I'm like, hey, I ain't coming over there where you're at. You just shunned me in front of all my friends. Completely interpreted differently. But that's how they see things. So actually, whenever I'm working a horse in the round pen, and there's a reason why we use a round pen. Does anybody know why? because it's round. It has no end, right? If I want to stand in the middle of that round pin and chase him out, I can make him think that he just run three miles to get out of the herd. And I can get his attention and I can keep him out of it until he decides to act the way he's supposed to and show me that he's willing to come back in and be respectful. And then I turn and I allow for him to join up with me, right? doesn't seem normal for the way that we interpret things, but it works completely for a horse. All of a sudden, I've shown him that I'm the leader. I'm his protector. He doesn't need to be looking around for what's worrisome or what's the problem. You need to pay attention to me because I'm the leader, right? And there's a way for me to teach him how to lead. The next thing I got to do with the horse is I got to understand how they, not only in a communication type of way, but how that they work right? How they interpret things. What is, the, what is his way of being able to understand and interpret um, a, a, a pressure, right? So if I'm going to control all parts of his body, I want to be able to take and place his legs here or there, I need to be able to push him, right? And the way that a horse works is that any pressure that I apply to a horse, his reaction is to lean into my pressure, 
Have you ever been around livestock and you go to like walk around one and you push it around and they're like shoving you into the wall and you're like trying to push them away from you and they shove into you? Has anybody ever experienced that? Yeah. Why do they do that? I'm pushing you. You should move away. Well, that is part of it, right? They think that you're attacking them. Any kind of attack, if the horse is going to defend himself in the wild, they're going to be eaten or attacked from the hind end or the flank. So when we're bucking horses or we're bucking bulls, they actually put a flank strap. Flank strap doesn't go around their privates or anything like that. It's actually a tender spot that you just put a flank strap on and it makes them buck. Why? It's a natural reaction, right? So whenever I go to push them or use them, that is actually one of their natural reactions is to go into that pressure. If you're going to come up and bite it, I want to kick at what it is that you're doing. So it's a really tender spot. It's right in the flank, right? But their whole body works that way. If you watch a racehorse whenever they're racing, when they're racing, that jockey, it's kind of funny. The jockey's sitting up there and he's pulling. He's pulling and the horse goes faster. So he pumps him and he pumps him and he pumps him, Right? He's using the horse's natural knowledge, his natural instinct, to what he pulls on his mouth, that horse shoves his nose into that bridle, and that's what makes him run. Part of what makes him go faster is he pulls, and as he pulls, that horse pushes, and that gets him to run harder and harder. It's also the reason why it takes him another half a mile to stop that horse, because they got no brakes, <laughs> right? And then whenever people go, I just bought a horse off the track and I'm going to do all this with it. And I don't know how to ride real well, but we're just going to get along and figure it out. And he goes up and something spooks him and he jumps up to a lope and they go, oh my God. And then they pull and the horse goes, let's run. <laughs> right? Well, he rode before. No, it doesn't work the way you think that it interprets for the horse. Right? That's why some of this stuff doesn't work. It doesn't, because it's not the way you think it works. And in order for it to work the way that the horse needs to work, we have to retrain, right? We have to take this horse and teach him to work the opposite of the way nature has made him. The way he understands, interprets everything, I have to break that down, take all of it away and change it completely. So that whenever I apply pressure with my spur at the shoulder or the rib cage or the hip, I can control each part of his body. I can lift it up. I can lift his belly up. I can lift his shoulders up. I can move his rib cage and his hip. But why is it that I push it instead of just, well, if he pushes into pressure, why wouldn't I just touch on this end and he pushes into my pressure? I can teach him that way too. And some people do do that. The problem with it is the foundation of it. If I do it that way, I can never ask for more. I can never say, come into my leg more. If he decides not to, what am I gonna do? If I teach him to move away from it, I can control everything and I can raise it up to a different level. Without that, I can't do it, right? So I have to work completely against his nature. The next thing that I've gotta be able to do with a horse is that I've got to be able to, once that we've created this language, we've created a relationship, right? and we understand his position and my position in the scheme of things, then I have the next part is to reach this level to where he trusts me that when I say stop, you lay on the brakes with all the confidence in the world. The only way that I'm gonna get him to spin on that loose rein or do all the things run through and I can get them to run and do anything. I can run them straight through wherever. I can jump them. I can do one, anything that I want to do with them. But part of it is because I actually ride these horses five to six days a week, every single week, for two years straight, just to get them to the first time in the show pen. It's a, it's a relationship. It's spent time together over and over and practice and practice and practice. And then there's another level. Once we get to where we understand everything, the next part is accountability. Because at some point, I've got to take this horse and he's got to be held accountable for what he's doing, not just because I said I do it, but because he knows and has the understanding and the knowledge of actually what to do and I can account on him to do it. And that's probably one of the tougher things to be able to teach a horse. 
It's actually one of the toughest things for most trainers to teach a horse to do to reach this level. And it's really, really hard for most amateurs to even figure out. Because the hardest part about that is you have to allow one to make a mistake. Once we've controlled everything, we get so used to controlling everything that I want to micromanage him so much that I don't let him make a mistake. I don't let him ride a foot or two off the circle. And eventually what I've got to do is I place him in a place and I've got to put my hand down and say, make the mistake. Right? If you make the mistake, I can help you. I can fix you. But if you never make a mistake, you're always wondering what's out there. Well, maybe if I just do this, he'd leave me alone. Right? And as silly as it is, I watch people ride around and they're riding and the horse goes and does, but he's kind of a little high-headed and he's kind of a little frothy at the mouth because he's hanging on. He's a little chargy and pushy and whatever else, but he can get around with it. And to me, it's like, woof, that's so offensive, right? And everybody else is like, well, he looked really good. And I'm like, well, that's terrible, right? But it's the same thing as if I would, you know, but it's just the lack of knowledge and lack of seeing, right? But it's about as silly as if I was to go, I got a new dog. I got a new puppy. And I've taught him how to stay. It's incredible. The dog is really, really smart. It took me about five minutes. This thing stays like nobody's business, right? Let me show you. Watch. This is little Fred, right? Watch. Stay. Stay. <laughs> See? What are you laughing at? I haven't let him go. Right? It's silly to think that that's, wow. I told him, watch, stay. We ain't moving any, stay, 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 good, stay. Right? Let's see, see, five minutes. That thing, he's not, he stays right there, right? It's not impressive, right? Same thing that I see. There's no freedom in it. There's no mistakes made. What do you have to do to teach a dog to stay? You tell him stay, and you have to like let go and step away. When he makes a mistake, I can set him back. Right? And then we go at it again until he learns to stay. I might get a little further and a little further each time. I want to make sure I come back and reward him before he goes and walks off every single time. But at the same time, I have to release that. I have to let that go in order to make those mistakes. Right? That's what's the coolest part about training the horse is whenever they, you have that kind of relationship that you're actually working with one that he has a desire because he's given the chance to make the decision, right? And he's not fearful of making the wrong decisions. One of the coolest things about getting to show and train horses for a living, because I have to admit, I got a pretty cool job. It's a pretty neat one. And I didn't go into it because well, obviously, because I wasn't going to get rich, because I'm not rich. But I did it because I didn't really care. If I figured if one day I could buy a new truck, I was going to be doing it quite all right. That's all I really cared about. It's just this is what I wanted to do. The best part about it is I started to find out, and I had a kind of a, a point in my life where I started to realize that this was, I thought, this was my calling, right? This is what I was supposed to be doing. This was how I was going to, I was going to glorify God and the things that I was doing, right? And it was a pretty good way to do it because I was having a pretty good time, right? That was kind of cool. And everybody wanted to see the horses that I was riding and wanted to be, you got to go to the big shows and ride the big stuff, right? And it was pretty neat. I got flying all over and getting to show horses and ride horses with people all over. What I realized is that all of that was really prepar preparing me for a whole different level once I got to that point, right? It was really reflective of what my walk in Christ has really been like. At the beginning, there was a knowing. There was a whole new language, right? I had to actually have a conversation. And part of that conversation was actually more than just reading some scripture and trying to find out what was going on, but I had to spend time getting to know him, who he was, more than just, you know, something that we come in and sing a little praise to, but how do I get to know him? How do, how do I delve into him? How do, how do I figure out what he is? How, like, and what his attributes are? 
And he's revealed himself to us in two different ways. He's revealed himself to us in, our, in his special revelation, which is the Bible. But there's a lot of us that read a lot of scripture and misinterpret a lot of what's being said in the scripture. So we can read it and think about, well, I can serve myself in some of the things that are said in there. And it can kind of get confusing. I don't know if I'm, whether I'm reading it or interpreting it correctly or not. But he also gave us his natural revelation. And that's everything around us. We can walk around and be in complete awe of some 50-story building and the architecture behind it and the stacks of concrete and how wow and cool or how much technology there is in the phone and it's all in this little bitty square and it's incredible, right? That all of that's in that little deal. And you walk by a tree that performs photosynthesis and it creates oxygen for you. But you walk by it like it's a tree. To me, it's astounding. And it tells you about him as much as the book does. It's intelligence. There's so much intelligent design behind that, it'll floor you. Oh, science. We can figure science. You can't explain photosynthesis. You can give me an idea, but you can't even recreate it. But I got a phone. <laughs> right? And it's what you need. You can't even tell me how this stuff, you can't tell me how your eyeball works. But I got a phone. Right? It's absolutely incredible. And I get to spend the time with it all day long. And it retells, it tells my story. Because once I got to spend that time and have that relationship and start to get to know him more, right? Then it stepped into the next part of what's my nature? Horse's nature is to move into pressure, right? And I need to teach that horse to not move into pressure, to move off of pressure. So what's my nature? My nature is a sinful nature. All of our nature is a sinful nature. Some horses, man, I can show them two times and they get it. It's just, those are so cool. You get no idea. They just, they step in. They're just so intelligent. And then you have some that are like me, that are pretty hard-headed. And I got to show them. And two years later, I got to show them again. And I'm still showing them. Is the talent worth it? If the try is there, it definitely is, right? But it's his nature. Once I train a horse, does it know it and it's got it forever? No. People go, oh, he's a finished horse. To me, they're never finished. It's a work in progress forever. Because it's their nature to go and revert. Some revert fast, some don't. But it is your nature. It's my nature. As much as I don't want to do some of the things, I still do the dumb things. Ask my wife. And then the next part is, I again to the point where I find out at the same time, I teach this horse accountability, right? And I'm starting to wonder, why is it that, why is it that I have all this trouble? Man, as hard as I'm trying, I'm trying to do these right things and trying to be better, but man, I just, as soon as I fix one thing, it's another thing. And I go like, oh, and now we gotta work on that one too, right? I thought once I got to this point, I wouldn't have that. I wouldn't be that kind of guy anymore, right? There's a reason why he leaves me in that position. The reason why he leaves me in that position is because I'm silly enough to think that within three days, if I wasn't having any trouble and I wasn't sinful, I did it myself. That's how we all are. You give me a little bit of time, I think I did it all myself. And when do we really learn? How many times do you remember how it was just something easy and you figured it out? Or how many times do you remember those hard times that you had, the things that you struggled on the most? 
the hardest places you had to work through, there was your biggest lessons. We look at it and we go, man, I, I, I have to go through these troubles. Any good father doesn't save his children from having struggles. We don't want them to go through some of the tough stuff that we did, and I hate to watch my kids do it. But that's where they learn. Our job isn't to keep them from having trouble. Our job is to guide them through the trouble. Allow them to have the hard times so that we can fix them and help them while they're in it. That's when I realized, well, but I thought all the winning, the big championships and writing books and whatever else was where I was supposed to be at. I realized that that was a place where he was allowing me to have my biggest struggles. To realize that later on, I had got given the gift of... Um, me and my wife have adopted four kids. And that's when I found it was hard. Because now I got to figure out how I let go of me in the process, right? And live for a whole different purpose. These little people that live in my house have no respect for the trophies I've won. <laughs> Not one bit. They don't care. What they do care about is how I guide them, how I lead them. How do I lead them? Everything that I've learned with the horse was in preparation for what I was going to be used for. Not to glorify him through those things, but to glorify my ch helping my children leading them in the right direction and understanding and helping them understand that path to salvation. Where do we get it from? And what does it look like? It's not something that ends today. It's a work in progress. It's part of your life. And count yourself blessed enough to have the troubles. Lord knows we're having plenty of troubles. Right now in our country and the things that we're going through, it's tough all around. And if you're not having a tough time, I can show you plenty that are. Are we worthy of that trouble? He's not gonna lead you into it unless you are worthy of that trouble. How do we th be thankful for the hard times? That's how. Because the hard times show me that my father in heaven, just like my father on earth, is not going to spare me from those hard times. I don't keep my horses from having the hard times. I let them bury themselves. I let them bury themselves in the hard times that they have and the troubles that they have because when I help them out, they have so much better of an understanding of why and the purpose in all of it. And the craziest thing is, it's revealing to me. They show me so much about myself, it's not even funny. It's kind of a scary time that we're in. The further we are, the further we live from our food source, the harder it is. It really is. I'm pretty lucky. You know, we all are spending time getting a bunch of chickens right now, so we can all raise eggs. It's kind of a good thing. Your kids need to know that eggs come from a chicken's butt. <laughs> right? As gross as that is. We all need to know and contemplate the impending death that we all have. That's why it's scary. You can't run from it. And now it's in front of us. But count ourselves worthy of being given the opportunity to contemplate it. I, in my hope, I hope that, and it's always kind of scary whenever I go to speak at some of these deals because it's, 
I've made a career out of um, coveting the trophy, coveting the race, going to reach the different levels, right? And I still like to. Oh, don't get me wrong. I love to win. I really do. I, I really like chasing that. It's also a hard thing. Because I don't want to identify myself with that too. So it's a struggle. It's an internal struggle that I have. It's not, and I really don't want, really don't want to win because I want everybody else to see me a certain way. I just like winning. And I really want to beat you. I liked it, right? Um, but in doing that, the slippery slope is that I kind of like the accolades too. I don't want it to be about that. I want it to be about that you see the way that I live my life. Not that because it's an envious thing of what my life is, but because I want my life to be more than anything to show that the same as it would be for my own father, but the grace and the gratitude for the opportunities that I've been given. And I don't want it to be looked upon as because of me. The best phrase that I ever got before going into the show pen, because I used to show really aggressive. I would show really, really hard, and I had to dial that back because actually crazy part about horses is they read every bit of your emotions. And the harder that I would show, the more tight and the tense the horse would get and things would get really, really like intensified, right? And you don't really want them necessarily fearful of what you're doing. So I had to let some of that go, right? And the best phrase that somebody gave me was when you go in there, unleash your grace. Whole new spin on it. Unleash my grace. That's what I want to be seen in the pen. That's what I want to be seen in my life, is that I unleash that grace. That it's the gratitude and the thanks for something I didn't deserve, that I still don't, and because I'm not worthy of any of it. Not in the slightest bit. <laughs> because what you see here looks pretty good. I'm still a guy that yells at kids, gets upset, sick and tired of them not picking up their stuff, you know, upset because my wife isn't telling me I'm good looking enough. She's not chasing me around the yard. I chase her around the yard. She didn't chase me around the yard. <laughs> the same things that we all go through. I want to sugarcoat this and make it look like it's something it's not. I want you to see the grace that I have, the thanks that I want to, ex to express for the opportunities that I've been given because I don't deserve a bit of it. Not one bit. I think it's important for me to be able to share and take time to understand, for people to understand the process of coming to that Savior, that your need for it if you understand your position, you're broken, like we all are. I like to think that I'm not, but my wife knows that I am, right? But I am, and we all are. And if we don't have an answer for it, there is an answer. And the trials and the troubles are not because he doesn't care. It's because he does. That's how he grows us. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. I need to think. I think Phil's got a few more drawings. I'm hanging on to my number just in case I win something. <laughs>